Welcome to the Dean's Speaker Series. I'm Ken Freeman, Dean of the School of Management. We have students, faculty, members of the community, recruiting companies and others in the room with us today. We're excited to have you with us as we engage in a very timely discussion, a discussion about the future of the world economy, which has relevance for every one of us in this room and for every global citizen. I'd like to welcome our four panelists that are with us today. Each brings a unique perspective on what's happening in the world the world of investments, the world of public policy, the world of economics, and the world of business. I'd like to also thank at the outset our co-sponsors here at the Boston University School of Management, Alpha Kappa Psi Professional Business Fraternity, and the MBA Finance Club. Would you join me in a round of applause for our sponsors? <laughs> our topic today is a very, very complex one. And we intend to cover a lot of ground, and toward that end, a few words about the format. Uh, first, I would make a respectful request of everyone in the room, panelists and audience alike, if you've got an electronic device with you that's on, if it's a cell phone, smartphone, beeper, uh, tablet, PC, uh, please turn it off. It, it impacts the sound system, and we'd prefer that you turn it off if you would please do so. We'd very much appreciate it. Our format this afternoon is quite straightforward. Uh, we're going to hear brief comments, and we've all committed to target five minutes each. And I actually have a timer here uh, to help ensure we adhere to the rules. Uh, five minutes each from each of our four panelists to hear an overview statement about the state of the world economy. And I'll be the timekeeper. We'll then continue the dialogue among the panelists and also field your questions, questions from the audience, to assist us in getting your questions heard. Uh, we have runners in the aisles that have provided you with three by five cards, I believe, when you came in the room. So if you have a question that comes to mind along the way here, please take a moment to write down your questions. Uh, folks will be coming down the aisles to collect the three by five cards. They'll be delivering them to me, and we'll do our very, very best to have all the questions addressed, but I can almost guarantee you right now uh, that we won't get specifically to each and every question, but we'll do our best to encounter and address all the various themes that you raise in the questions and the topics that you put on the, on the three by five cards. So let's, let's jump right in here. Uh, and let me first introduce our panelists more broadly. We have Jeff Knight here from Putnam Investments, Michael Salinger, professor of, of management here at the School of Management at Boston University, John Zhao of Honey Capital in Beijing, and Larry Kotlikoff from just down the street at the College of Arts and Sciences Department of Economics. So we're gonna start first with, with Jeff. Jeff Knight is the head of global asset allocation at Putnam Investments. He oversees institutional and individual portfolios, as well as the asset allocation investment process for Putnam's multi-asset portfolios. He joined Putnam in 1993. Uh, he authors the Capital Markets Outlook that Putnam issues quite frequently. He's a CFA. He's been in the investment industry since 1987, which was a, one of another uh, series of monumental years in the history of the economy. So he's seen his fair share of ups and downs. So Jeff, the question we'll lead off with, the world economy is in crisis. I believe we'd all agree about that as a panel. Uh, what happens next? It sure feels like it's in crisis, although I don't, I don't know if it has to be. In my five-minute summary of the global economy, I, I would say that we happen to be in the, in the midst of two seismic changes that are really shaping everything. The first has to do with the dynamics of debt. And I think if any of you study economics, a very interesting question in economics is, what's the right level of debt in an economy? What's the right level of, of leverage? And these days, I think a knee-jerk reaction might be, well, zero. We shouldn't have, it's bad. We shouldn't have any. But if you think about it, it makes sense to use debt financing for something like home ownership, where you plan to live in a residence for not two weeks, but 35 years or something, and you, to, to help finance that. Or uh, student loans is another, is another one. Certainly corporate formation and corporate financing for long-term research and other, other projects. So whatever it is, it's not zero. And I would argue that early in my career, you could make the case that the level of debt across the major economies in the world was below that optimal level. And I won't go into too much of explanation of that. But slowly but surely, it started to rise. And that is a fun process to be a part of, as there's more lending, as there's more borrowing. For a time, it exaggerates your standard of living to a certain degree, right? Think about this country. We all wanted bigger homes, we all wanted big giant SUVs, we wanted flat screen TVs, and it was easy to get, you could put it on your credit card. And this is a dynamic that 
played out and, and for most of my early career was very much shaping not only what was happening in the world economy, but the, but the lessons we sort of drew from it. Things like stocks always go up was one that was pretty easy to, to, to a pretty easy conclusion to draw. That process, however, I, the, the, the answer to that question though is not infinity. We shouldn't have infinite debt, right? And I think it's easy to say now, looking back, that at some point we crossed the line and got to a point where the debt levels, not just in the United States, but in Japan, across Europe, the United Kingdom, got to be too large. And one day, it became more difficult to service and to pay back that debt. We first saw it in the private sector, and it first felt like a crisis here when the mechanisms behind mortgage financing grew to such a Byzantine and highly leveraged state that a little bit of a problem paying off the most, uh, the diciest of those mortgages was able to cascade into a problem that almost sunk the financial system. Well, luckily it didn't, that was only a couple of years ago, but the thing that stopped it from toppling the financial system, in my opinion, was the levering up that happened at the public sector, which leaves the public sector now exposed to these debt dynamics. And the easiest place to see how that is not necessarily a safe situation is in Europe, where day by day we see headlines uh, highlighting the difficulty that the public sectors are having in servicing debt. So that's one big dynamic. And I think now we've just turned the corner from moving that debt intensity higher to moving that debt intensity lower, which is way less fun. The second, uh, I think, big, big change is in the patterns of where does economic growth come from. From the five-year period from 97 to 02, 95% of world GDP growth came from the United States economy alone. We were the growth engine in the world economy. And it, the rest of the world essentially was canceling each other out in terms of the growth rate. That's obviously not a sustainable state of affairs and it did not last. And now we're in a very different world where the developed economies are struggling to grow at all. And in the context of this debt repayment, will continue to struggle in my view, but, but highly populated and uh, modernizing economies, particularly China, but others as well, are now becoming the locomotive for growth in the world economy. And the dynamics of that in terms of patterns of trade, in terms of investment markets, I think will be profound in the years ahead as well. Thank you very much. And you still have uh, 53 seconds left. Wow. Yeah, That's the first time ever I finished on time. <laughs> well, congratulations. Well, uh, well, and I suspect Professor Kotzkoff may want to borrow those 53 seconds later. We'll see. Uh, our next panelist is Michael Salinger. Uh, Michael Salinger is our next panelist. He's the Jacqueline J. and Arthur S. Barr Professor of Management at the School of Management here at Boston University. He joined the school in the fall of 1990. Professor Salinger is the author of more than 40 book chapters and articles in academic journals. He recently served inside the Beltway in Washington, D.C. as the Director of the Bureau of Economics at the United States Federal Trade Commission from 2005 to 2007, so yet another very unique and interesting perspective. Michael, the same question for you. The world economy is in crisis. What happens next? Well, there, there are crises and there are crises. Three years ago, we were really in crisis, and the system could have collapsed and, and it's scary to think about how, how bad things could have gotten. We, we could have seen a c complete collapse of social order and we didn't see that. Right now, Europe is in crisis, but the United States is not necessarily an economic crisis. Uh, what we have now is a political crisis because even though we're not in economic, we, we have economic bad times now and it's going to take a while to, to fix that. Uh, but we have longer term problems that, that are going to become a crisis if we don't solve it. And Washington has become completely incapable of doing what we need to do. We have short run problems, we have long run problems, and what, what, what you're hearing in Washington is exactly the wrong solution to both of them. Uh, so what happens next? The election's going to matter a lot. Uh, and probably what happens in Congress is more important than what happens with the president. I'm sure. Gosh, John. You know, we were worried coming in that with esteemed panelists, they might take longer and less, more so than shorter to provide their oversight remarks, but this is very nice and crisp, phenomenal. Look, our, we'll turn to our third panelist now. Uh, we have John Zhao. We're very honored to have John with us today. John is the founder and CEO of Honey Capital 
the largest China-focused private equity investment firm uh, that's housed and based in China. It's based in Beijing. Uh, John is also Senior Vice President and Executive Board Director of Legend Holdings. You might know them best as the parent company of Lenovo Group. Uh, previously, John held a number of senior management positions along the way in investment and technology companies here in the United States. He was named one of the best private equity capitalists of the year in 2009. Uh, in 2009, was also named a top 10 of the best private equity investors in China. And also, uh, the firm was recognized by PEI in 2009 as one of the top 20 fund management companies with the best strength under the global financial crisis. And it was the only China firm uh, to be on the list. John, the same question. The world economy is in crisis. What happens next from your unique lens? I hope that long introduction doesn't take up any of my five I, minutes. I again. promise Thank it you. won't, John. <laughs> or, we, or we can do some carbon trading here, you know. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. Um, now that we've got uh, European to establish debt crisis and the U.S. established political crisis, China is also in somewhat crisis. It's called structural crisis. You know, after 30 years of very rapid development, most Chinese recognize that is not a sustained growth because the structure is wrong. You can't grow forever by selling cheap labor, pollute the air, and not focus on innovation. So all the problems are recognized. Solving the problem is the crisis. You know, restructuring will touch not only the economical side of the issue, but you know, inevitably it gets down to the social political side which is causing a lot of heartburn. But again, in Chinese, I notice there are some Chinese or Asian faces here. Crisis in Chinese are two Chinese characters called Wei Ji. The first one is crisis, as it translates into English. The second word that makes up the complete sense of crisis in Chinese is actually opportunity. So I think uh, whenever there is a need for change, uh, while it's painful to think about, it also represents opportunities. Uh, so I'm going to focus on, on China in terms of future a little bit. Um, you know, before the financial crisis in 2008, the world is very orderly. There was this cluster of country called developed nations and then the other called emerging nations. And then, of course, there are the other one as the forgotten nations. But then <laughs> the crisis came. All of a sudden, people are uh, struggling with new facts. The fact that the most powerful nation are not able to get out of this slowness and crisis. And uh, emerging countries keep emerging. And all of a sudden, the world order, as we knew it, is in disarray. And so by now, everybody recognizes that the old world order is no longer. You know, after crisis of 2008, we were not going to return to the old norm. So there's a new norm. But then the question is, what is the new norm? Um, we're still debating, and there's no consensus. What there is consensus of is, emerging nations will play a bigger role. So that's really what we're facing. China uh, continues to rise economically, continue to think about how its political system could support a sustained growth pattern economically. So those are all you know, uh, challenges that uh, that nation or us um, all face. The reason that I actually believe there's no issue that is U.S. issue or European issue or Chinese issue alone. Any issues out of these major blocks are a global issue. Because what we have accomplished very successfully in the last 30 years is to establish, this is thanks to economists, that uh, a better economy is a global economy or vice versa. You have the so-called comparative advantage, this and that. And there's no turning back barring from a major war probably. So how do we solve this? You know, I always assert two notions. One, people in different world have the same dream. In the past, most time when people de describe their common dreams, they talk about American dreams. 
but unfortunately, the American lifestyle, man to nature, is really not sustainable. You know, you can't, if you do a science project, you know, saying, think about everybody on Earth live the American dream. We don't have an Earth to live on anymore. So I think together we have to figure out a new sustained mode of operation, which cuts into economy, relative wealth, it cuts into environmental, how to use resources. Uh, unfortunately, we have a global economy, but regional or national <coughs> government. That's where a lot of these struggle goes. And it's gonna, be a, it's gonna be a very tough struggle. If you think about it, in US, the oldest, most efficient democracy, you know, the, there's two parties and then political bigotry could impact efficiency. Think about, you know, in Europe, you have a unified currency, but then different physical governing body. Uh, with all these things uh, going to other nations, uh, the difficulties just get amplified. But there's a hope, you know, in the old time we have Russia and the US and we're fighting Cold War. Really not, not, not for the good of anybody. But then we have G7. Think about, you know, developing uh, economy. Uh, advanced country has ob obligation responsibility to aid developing country. Now we have G20 where emerging country actually are joining force with developed country to try to shoulder the same responsibility. So I think there's a hope, but there's a lot of work to be done. Thank you. John, thank you. So we have three very similar but different uh, provocative points of view we've heard from so far. And now we bring up Larry Kotlikoff, who's professor of the Department of Economics here at Boston University. He's the uh, William Fairfield Warren Professor, which is the highest distinction a faculty member can achieve at the university. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Econometrics Society. He's a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research. You may have seen his work in the media uh, on, at Bloomberg and Forbes. He's also a blogger for The Economist. I'm not sure what he does in his spare time. Uh, he has also served as a consultant in, to many enterprises as well that are very, very famous and very influential all over the world. So Larry, uh, the question again is the same. The world economy is in crisis. What happens next? Well, let's see, uh, Italy defaults, we have a run on the banks, uh, the uh, financial system implodes, it spreads all over Europe, uh, it spreads to the US, the US financial system implodes, and uh, then it goes to the emerging countries perhaps. That's one scenario, and that's actually not, you know, that's a pretty low probability, but it's not zero. And because of that scenario, people are very uncertain. But the, f the fundamental reason that we uh, uh, are worried today and is, uh, well, there's three big problems that we're facing. One is a, a fiscal crisis in the developed world. The second is a financial system that isn't really functioning well and has inherent problems that aren't being fixed. We have the political crisis that uh, uh, it's just referred to. Uh, and then we have, so there's four things that are deep problems. The fourth thing is we have a coordination failure. We have to realize what the macroeconomic problem is in our country, which is that everybody is sitting on his hands thinking that everybody else is sitting on his hands and we need to coordinate behavior to change things around. Now, let me talk about the fiscal crisis that the US and Europe and Japan are facing. And China may face, too, if it continues with the kind of policies, fiscal policies that, that it's, I think, adopting and really by, by copying us. Now, what are the policies that we, what is the fiscal policy that we've been running since Eisenhower for six or so decades now? Well, we've been taking from young people and taking resources and giving them to old people. You guys over here are young. You guys over here are old. And I'm the government, and I come and I take money from you, I call it taxes. I'm going to say, I'm taking taxes from, from you, and I'm going to give it to you old people's transfer payments. But don't worry, because these taxes that I'm taking from you, you're going to get those back with a whole lot more when you're old. You're going to get the principal of these taxes and the interest and plus a whole lot more. And so then when you're sitting over here and you're old, I come to the next set of young people and I say, you know, I have to take more from you than I took from them. But don't worry about it. Yeah, it's taxes, but you're going to get it back. And, uh, and a whole lot more. 
and I keep doing this decade after decade. What does this sound like? It sounds like a Ponzi scheme. This is exactly what it is. This is a chain letter. And our problem is that because of the demographics and because of our growth, we don't have enough young people to buy into the chain letter to give to the old people. Now, in using the word taxes rather than borrowing, I could have said I'm borrowing from you now and I'm going to pay you back with uh, interest and then make you a transfer payment. If we'd used the different words, we would have official debt uh, that's uh, not 10 trillion, but probably uh, 300 trillion right now in the books. And we've used words to disguise what we're doing and to basically lie about our fiscal policy. And we've focused, the Congress has said, has used these words to keep the official debt small and to keep, keep people from seeing how big our total liabilities are. So if you make a balance sheet, you folks in business school are used to balance sheets. Think about our liabilities. We have our official debt, and then we have our unofficial debt, obligations to cover spending on Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid, defense expenditures, the president's lunch, gas for Air Force One. All those things are liabilities, and they were projected and present valued. The CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, does that. You come up with a present value. Then look at the assets. The assets are the financial wealth of the country and the present value of its taxes. So does the balance sheet balance for the US? No, the difference is called the fiscal gap. It's $211 trillion large. That's our fiscal gap. That's how much, that's the credit card bill of the US. And we're focused on a $10 trillion official debt when we have a $211 trillion problem. That our generation, my generation, and the older generation hopes to leave to you guys, those of you who are Americans. But if you're from Europe, the same story applies, except that the situation appears to be worse in the US. As a share of GDP, our fiscal gap is about 14 times GDP. In Greece, it's about 12 times GDP. In Italy, I guess it's about eight times GDP. In Germany, it's about three times GDP. Even though the demographics in Europe are worse, our, our healthcare system is so out of control that the Congressional Budget Office projects that uh, spending on Medicare and Medicaid which still just covers a minority, a small fraction of the population, is going to go from where it is now to another 13 percentage points of GDP over the next 75 years. That's a prescription for killing the economy, just dead. So we have to fix these things. There are ways to fix them. That's the fiscal problem. The financial problem is we have a, a financial system that's a trust me banking system where it, it relies on trust. And it doesn't show you what they're actually doing. It's like selling drugs with no Food and Drug Administration. If we had that kind of a system for the drug industry, we'd have people manufacturing cancer cures made out of uranium, which is what they did before the FDA came into existence. And also arsenic. arsenic. They used arsenic to make uh, cures for med you know, medical cures back in 1900. That's why the FDA came into existence. Because the Wall Street is allowed to keep its secret secret and not tell you what they're doing, they can, it's trust me, and they can uh, package uh, fraudulent securities or, or securities that are, 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 you know, are uh, suspected to be fraudulent. And then if enough people suspect this, you have a run on that system. It's a fraud run, and the whole thing collapses. That, that's what we saw in 2008. And the financial problems in Europe are really causing, the fiscal problems in Europe, the fact that, uh, Greece and Italy, if they were to default, they would bring down the banks. Uh, this is really interconnected uh, uh, a problem with the fi fiscal problem. So the fiscal and the financial systems are, uh, are like a downward, sp downward spiral. One has a problem, the other, it hurts the other system, and then that system has a problem and hurts the first system. There's ways to decouple these two things. We haven't done it. The third thing I want to focus on, uh, Michael mentioned the, the, the incredible uh, gridlock between or deadlock between uh, Republicans and Democrats. They're basically talking past each other, even though they, nece they don't necessarily have different fundamental goals, but they don't know how to talk to each other. They hate each other's guts. And that's, we need a basically a third party moving forward. But the, the last problem I want to mention here, very briefly, is the coordination failure. We need to get employers collectively who are sitting on about $2 trillion of cash to collectively invest. So if I were the president, I would get a room bigger than this. I get the top 1,000 CEOs together, and I say, put all your hands on your, on your uh, cheeks. And uh, what are you doing? You're sitting on your hands. Now take them out together. 
Let's coordinate your invest. What I want you to do is not just take your hands out together. That's an example of coordinated behavior. But I want you to coordinate to invest, to double your investment over the next two years. I want you to coordinate together to all of you, each one of you individually, but collectively to increase your employment by 5%. Uh, I want to go to the, the president should go to the bankers, take the top 1,000 bankers, banks, CEOs, and say, look, you're sitting collectively on 1.6 trillion in excess reserves. I want them lent out. I want you to take your hands behind, from under your, your uh, rear end and actually do something to move this economy forward. That can turn the country around, that kind of coordinated behavior, but you, re you need real leadership. Thank you, Larry. How about a round of applause for our panelists in their first response? Here? <laughs> We've heard four very different perspectives, but some similarities. Uh, Jeff, you commented on the, the, the fact that uh, the level of debt in the world is too high, it must come down, and that we've moved to a, a, a context that's now very much moving towards emerging nations having the growth fuel. Michael, you commented on the issue of the political crisis in addition to the fiscal crisis. John, you commented about the fact that, the, uh, that all issues now are global, uh, that emerging nations will play a much bigger role, and also that, that the, the real solution here relates to everyone having a common dream, if you will, that's very different than the traditional American dream with the Chevrolet and the American apple pie and what have you. Uh, and then, Larry, you put a cap on all of this by really linking it all together and indicating that corporations have a role to play because that's where the cash is today. The political system has a role to play in a dysfunctional world at the moment. And also that we've been borrowing not just since 2005, 2002. This borrowing has been going on through our lifetimes, through our lifetimes. And unfortunately, the legacy of this isn't for most of us on this stage, it's for the next generations. They're gonna have to really make the adjustment, unfortunately, and please continue to contribute to Medicare, though, for those of us that'll soon be on it. Uh, we really appreciate that. Now, let, let's move through, and uh, we'll ask a few questions. Again, if you have questions that you'd like to have asked, please fill out those three by five cards, pass them towards the middle, and we'll have runners coming down the aisles to collect them and bring them up to me. But we'll get started first with some questions just from this end. Maybe we could start with uh, the comment, Larry. You, you raised the question of investor trust. Investor trust, and, and Jeff, you're, you're dealing with investor trust uh, every single day in your world at Putnam. Now, how indeed can we restore trust in a financial system that, that most citizens, certainly of the U.S. and of the world today, would say is broken and is, is not deserving of trust? How can we, what are the steps that are going to need to be taken for this to happen? I actually have a very specific view on this, which is the, the I don't know if anybody really knows where investment returns come from anymore. And I think we need to go back to the future, back, back to the future a little bit in the, in the sense that, I don't know, in, in uh, 1995, 96, 97, 98, 99, every one of those years, the stock market was up at least 20%. And it was mostly in the form of capital gains. So you invest money in the stock market with the confidence that I'll be able to sell this to somebody else for more than I paid for it, and that's how I, how I make my money. Well, it wasn't always that way. And I, I increasingly, over the last 13 years, we haven't had very much appreciation at all. In fact, the stock market in this country has offered negative returns. We've had a lot of volatility, and that combination really, I think, undermines confidence very, very deeply. The way I think you get back to uh, a, a, the right kind of confidence is for the emphasis to shift away from the capital gain mentality and maybe more towards dividends, maybe more towards uh, care, positive carry, towards uh, interest income, whatever it is, so that there's not this, we're not asking uh, for capital on a blind faith promise that someday you'll get it back, but rather, we're asking for capital with a much more straightforward deal as to how you get compensated for providing that capital. Larry, did you want to add something? Yeah, I would ch fundamentally change the financial system in the following way, and it goes back to, to Jeff's uh, business, which is a, a mutual fund company. And, I, and by the way, I don't work for mutual fund companies at all. But mutual fund companies uh, basically market small banks. Each mutual fund is a bank and they get their money by selling shares. So they're 100% equity financed. So if we tell all the financial corporations that are incorporated in the US, I'm talking about insurance companies, hedge funds, banks, commercial banks, investment banks, tell them all, 
The one and only way you can operate is as an unleveraged mutual fund company where you're issuing 100% equity finance mutual funds, then we will never have a bank failure again. We'll never have financial collapse again. This, this instability in macroeconomics associated with banking collapses, which goes back for you know, hundreds of years, uh, goes back to the you know, 1500s and when, when Ferdinand II defaulted in Spain, uh, that won't arise. And the other aspect of fundamental reform here, which I call limited purpose banking, is to have a single federal regulator, we have about 120 federal and state regulators, get one federal regulator to do what the FDA does, which is uh, to uh, hire a company, they would hire companies to who work just for it, to rate people's paper, whether it's a mortgage or a, a small big business loan or a corporate bond, uh, to rate it, to verify it. So if Michael's trying to take out a mortgage, the federal financial authority I'm talking about would double check that he actually has a job. We wouldn't rely on Angelo Mazzillo, who ran Countrywide Financial, to claim that he actually has a job. There would be no liar loans. And uh, they would check his, the, they would appraise the value of his home. They would uh, check his credit rating, and it would be all disclosed on the web in real time. And then the mutual funds that I'm talking about would bid for his paper at auction. So he would get the highest price for his paper, for his mortgage, and get the, therefore have to pay the lowest interest rate. So there are ways, straightforward ways, to fi fix the US and the world financial system and turn it from a, show, from a trust me banking system into a show me banking system. And if we had that in Europe in place today, guess what? Greece could default, Spain could default, all the biggest countries could default without it bringing down the financial system. The reason that there's a crisis there in Europe associated with the potential default here is because these banks who are running this financial highway are in danger of going under because they've made promises to bondholders, to, to, to depositors, to different uh, creditors that they can't really keep. They've made promises they can't keep. So that's the way to get around this. Don't make promises you can't keep and move from show, uh, trust me to show me banking. So if we build on your thoughts and the fact that trust is inherent in any system that works, I, let's think about Europe for a minute. So much is happening. The dynamics in Europe are so dramatic. Uh, today, uh, the government in Italy is coming, toppling down, uh, following Greece. And Greece is the 32nd largest economy in the world, the size of California economically. And, and it's really caused a shockwave around the world. The, the question really on, on a lot of people's minds is, well, where will this end? <laughs> You know, in fact, if you look back a few years, it started in Iceland and Ireland and has moved along. Uh, so, Michael, maybe from your perspective, as you think about this process and how it's going to evolve, where will it end in Europe? Will this lead to a, a, the, a danger of the euro unraveling, the, the model of governance in Europe going away as part of this? Or is there a, is there a solution here uh, that goes beyond uh, where we are today, which is a lot of confusion? Well, predicting exactly where it's going to end is a little bit like predicting when the next earthquake is going to be. Uh, it's something that's very hard to do. I agree with Larry that there's a, uh, that, that there's a scenario, a disastrous scenario, uh, and that the probability is not zero and we really don't have any idea whether it's a one in a thousand year event or a one in a hundred year event or a one in ten year event, uh, which is pretty scary, actually. Uh, one of the things we know from the history of regulation is that there is a tendency after a crisis to overreact. Uh, so I think it's, it's important that when we look back at what created the problems, that we, uh, that we focus on, on, on what the real problems were and we not try to fix absolutely everything. So, uh, so I wouldn't, I worry with what Larry said that that he wants to get rid of debt altogether, and uh, and, and, and and I fear that might be an overreaction. This is just debt by the financial intermediaries because they have no reason to be leveraged. Their job is to connect uh, borrowers and, and lenders and savers and investors. Their job is to be uh, middlemen. It's not to uh, gamble, take in money, say I'm sure I'm going to pay it back. Don't worry, then gamble with it, lose their shirts, and then turn to the taxpayer to bail them out. That's the kind of situation we have. Now, Larry, but let's build on your comments and Michael's. Go ahead, Michael. Well, so, so, so where did things fall down? One place things fell down was with the ratings agencies, which 
uh, which way underestimated the risk of default. And it's kind of amazing that people thought that the securities that were created could actually be as safe as United States government securities, but but somehow they, they, they fooled themselves into doing that. So, so, so that part of the system has to be changed. And then picking up on, on what Jeff said earlier, one of the things that happened with the crisis was that once defaults occurred, the system had become so complicated that, that, that it wasn't clear how you could renegotiate the debts. Because when you took debts and you divided them up among, uh, among a lot of different people and you had to get authorization from them or agreement from them, uh, from all of, the, uh, all of the rights owners to renegotiate the debt, uh, that, um, that that was basically an impossible thing to do. So we need to uh, to, 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 to prevent uh, to prevent the problem where you can't uh, so, you so can't renegotiate if, the default. So if Greece or and or Italy fail, will that have the same impact that Lehman failing in the United States had? Will it cascade into a, another step in the meltdown? Greece, no. Italy, yes. I, I, I think scale wise. Greece has, for all intents and purposes, I think, already defaulted, already failed. The process is pretty far advanced figuring out how to take those losses, but there's no question that there are losses. Italy's a tougher call. Um, I, it's not necessarily too far gone, I don't think, at this point, but if it gets to that, then now, now you've taken this, now you've boomeranged the problem, that private sector problem becomes public sector problem, but the banks, own all of this government debt. And so if you default in Italy, that goes right back to the private sector through the French banks. And I don't think there's enough capital across Europe t to stop that if you, if you truly get uh, that kind of a default pattern going. Let's bring it into the room for a minute. How many students in the room have student debt? Just show of hands, please. Student debt. Uh, risk is becoming a, an enduring burden for young Americans and young citizens from all over the world. Various estimates say that student debt in this country approaches $1 trillion. Uh, a question would be, uh, in fact, there's more student debt outstanding today than there is credit card debt, I believe, in this country. How does the student debt crisis, which is looming, get resolved? Uh, should it be repriced? Should there be a variable repayment schedule based on one's income? This is a looming debt crisis for the next generation, for all of you in the audience. How do we address this problem, which is way before you get Medicare and Social Security? I mean, how do we address this problem that's looming? Well, the, uh, the Chileans have a system whereby they, they basically pool risk of, uh, across uh, students. Some are going to have high earnings and some are going to have low earnings. So they let you borrow to go to school. A lot of their uh, higher education is private. There's big, been big protest down in Chile about that fact, but the way the uh, the borrowing works is that I think I think I've got this right that you have to pay back five percent of your salary, no no higher, uh, over time, and uh, that's a cap. So that means somebody who makes it really big, they pay five percent of a big number, and somebody who doesn't do well, pays a small number, but it's just five. It's manageable. Well, there, there are American universities that have experimented with that, and it was a disaster. Uh, because what happened was the art student, by and large, it was the art students who signed up uh, to sign over 5% of their salary. Uh, but then there were... My friends here primarily, so Michael. Uh, the, uh, and, and then a handful of people who, uh, who ended up having quite lucrative careers. But the way the system was set up was the, the, you, you weren't out of your debt until the entire pool had been re repaid. And so you had people who had borrowed $2,000 and they were paying 5% of their income uh, you know, well into the future. So if you're going to set up a system like that, it's gotta, it's gotta be a mandatory system, which would be a very hard thing to sell. But if you let people opt into it, you're going to, to create a big problem. So this is really, we're having quite an optimistic discussion this afternoon. Am I in the same meeting you are? I mean, quite optimistic. So, so John, you've gotta rescue us. John, was, it's up uh, to you. I, I have a question for you here. Uh, it comes from the audience. Wanna move on, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, China is dealing with a very different problem currently than, than the U.S., certainly in many other countries in the world, and it's, it's the big I word called inflation. 
where the government's targeted a stated goal of 5% inflation. It's currently above 6%. Uh, the recent decline in commodity prices around the world will no doubt help, but a major structural issue looms uh, for China. Now, how far do you believe the Chinese government will go? How far will the Chinese government go to maintain confidence in an increasingly fragile system using a form of capitalism that we would argue and, and allege, certainly, is, 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 a, is a refinement to the traditional capitalistic approach. Yeah, in the Western term, uh, confidence, if it meant confidence about growth in the economy, uh, the Chinese government uh, doesn't have to try very hard. As a matter of fact, it's just reverse. They've been trying to cool it down. But the Chinese government will go extremely far. As a matter of fact, you know, nothing will stop it trying to maintain stability. So in China, the key word is social stability, order. So that, uh, you know, because the consensus, this is not a government thing. I think the general consensus is that if China, for whatever political system is, if it could maintain social orders and stability, it will continue to create wealth, which is a good thing. Uh, that's the recent history. Uh, to that extent, uh, if you step back and say from economical point of view, my view is that inflation is not a bad thing for Chinese. It's actually a good thing because after all these years, you know, lower wages, living on very, very minimum living standard while supporting a very lavish lifestyle enjoyed by development country, you know, think about all this deflation we've had in the last 20 years. It's because China is importing very cheap, you know, uh, products at a cost to their own living standard. It's just in the last few years we see wages gone up. The other, key, you know, sensitive issue that has a very different uh, arguments on both sides is um, exchange rate. If it weren't for stability, I think Chinese government would jump to you know, appreciating 40% overnight. But then all of this would cost. It can't, it's a shock. It, the system would not digest it. So much so that then there'd be social unrest, then you know, instability, and then everything will be set to zero. So I think there's a genuine general consensus about the stability being important and, and you're paying a premium you know, you know, appreciation of living standard for that. So that's, that's where we are. Fascinating. Culture does make a difference, doesn't it? Very much so in how governments and how societies operate. If we look back in history, and this links to a question from the audience, uh, for 90% of recorded history, China has been the world's largest economy. It is not quite there today. Do you believe, and I'd ask some of our other panelists for their views as well, John, wh where do you think? Will China become number one again? If so, when? And what are the key factors that will determine uh, China becoming the world's largest economy? Yeah, if you measure this by total GDP, yes, uh, soon. As a matter of fact, uh, there are statements, uh, estimation that says China will become the largest uh, uh, economy by GDP measure. Uh, between 2020 to 2027. Um, and then there's other economists says, if you measure this by real buying power, uh, China is there already. Um, I think, you know, there's no doubt China will become the largest economy uh, in terms of its total size. But that, that doesn't, doesn't say a lot. China has 1.4 billion people. And uh, if you measure by their living standard, you know, the so-called happiness index, China is still very, very far behind. Let's turn to the United States and, and housing for a minute. Another question from the audience. Uh, housing uh, in this country remains anemic. 14 million homes are in foreclosure. Uh, housing starts continue at record lows despite record low mortgage interest rates. Uh, the great home ownership experiment, one could argue, has exploded or imploded, depending on where you sit. Uh, and we continue to see the after effects. Uh, should the U.S. government intervene to remove the mortgage overhang, and if so, how? <laughs> my job is to stump the stars here. I'm trying my best. I can. Uh, yes, Larry. Uh, it's a difficult problem because it's a horrible situation for so many people. But uh, if the government starts to come in and start break up uh, contracts then uh, the lenders in the future will be uncertain about making loans, about what they're actually going to get back. 
and we might end up with longer term high interest rates and really kill the housing market for good. So what I think we really need to do is get the economy rolling and that's trying to get rid of the, uh, deal with this coordination failure problem in the kinds of ways I was talking about. You know, what if we got every employer in the country to increase, at least the ones with 100 or more employees, to increase their employment by 5%? What if we ask the workers and the corporations to take a bit of a pay cut to help make that happen and get paid in the form of shares from the shareholders so that it wasn't really coming fully out of their pockets? Well, we would have more people employed, we'd have more people buying things, we'd have more demand. You see, you have to realize that economics is not old-fashioned Keynesian economics anymore. Macroeconomic theory has, was there for a while, and then there was some other theory focused on real business cycles where we viewed economic fluctuations as arising from technological shocks. Well, the Keynesian view that markets aren't working because of sticky prices and wages, that doesn't seem to be relevant now. Nor does the, the theory that we've got a technological shock here, because technology hasn't really uh, depreciated. The real theory that team, seems to me to be relevant is coordination fail failure, which a number of economists, a lot in our department in economics, have worked on over the decades. And uh, that's, that says that there's more than one equilibrium the economy can land in. And, if, and that uh, we don't have markets being cleared it by an auctioneer and where supply exactly equals demand. If I'm uh, you know, worried uh, about hiring somebody because I don't think they're going to, uh, because I don't think anybody's going to be buying my, anybody else is going to be hiring, and therefore I won't be able to sell my product, then I can take that view. The other person who could hire will take the view, and in effect our, uh, our worry will turn into reality. And this is what Roosevelt said, the only fear to fear is fear itself. And that's a very big fear. And you don't deal with that fear just by making that statement. You deal with it by understanding the insight of it and turning things around, trying to coordinate collective behavior to get everybody employed. And then when people have jobs, the housing market will turn around. So, so if we build on that notion, and Mike, did you want to add a comment? Yeah, so um, as a former antitrust enforcement official, I can't help commenting on Larry's comments that we just need, that the, that, the, that, the, that, the, that the president needs to get the CEOs of this country in the room and tell them to coordinate. Uh, that gives me the willies. Um, coordinate hiring, not price fixing. Uh, yes, well they seldom get, as Adam Smith observed, they seldom get into the room together without coordinating on things they shouldn't coordinate on. Uh, yeah, more work. I, so. John, we're going to need I, you to I, keep these guys apart. I, 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 I should know better than to take on Professor Kotlikoff on <laughs> macroeconomics, since he has a textbook on macroeconomics and I don't. But I would. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would challenge the notion that, uh, that old style Keynesian economics doesn't have a lot to teach us. Uh, first of all, I mean, we've been talking about the housing problem. The housing problem is a problem of prices not adjusting, uh, which, 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 which is the problem that gave rise to, um, uh, to Keynesian economics. Uh, it, it's obvious that, that, the, that the labor market isn't adjusting. And what we have is a, is a failure of aggregate demand. And the solution for it is for, uh, for the government to uh, in, in the short run to, to, to be running def to, to, to stimulate the economy with, with stimulative fiscal policy. Would you like a rebuttal? You have time for that? <laughs> well, just, just to be sure I'm in the middle, which I think is needed for now. Uh, and I'm going to pose a question, but by citing a set of facts as I observe it. Uh, Larry, actually, the great uh, ambition you just stated was truly and duly implemented by Chinese government in 2009. I remember one financial crisis is happening. It was initially in China called the uh, sub-debt crisis, then the financial crisis. By September, when Lehman fa fell, and quickly in Beijing there was consensus, oh gosh, this is going to come to us. It's going to come to us in form of economical crisis. 
So then we need to really get our act together and the stimulus, you know, putting a stimulus package and, 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 and get our economy going. And uh, that year, the early part of the year, the economy was growing at 12% a year. So they actually put in a lot of measures to cool it down. By September, they sensed this. By November, there's a four trillion uh, that was established. At the end of the day, it was eight trillion altogether because there's central government. Then, in according to the fashion, there is this provincial municipality. But I remember this so vividly. You see, I made a mission out of our, ourselves as you know, congressmen to privatize state-owned companies. I just because I'm a true student of capitalism, as we were discussing. I just thought that was, you know, so we needed to. But then, right after that juncture, there was no way we could go privatize a state-owned company. What happens is that the state used their coordinated effort as a show, shareholder, pumped all the four trillion, eight trillion through primarily state-owned control pipes. Okay, the fact today are two sets, and you know, we have to judge, you know, I, I guess history. One, China, as a result of that coordinated effort, didn't get into a deep recession. As a matter of fact, bounced out very quickly. Didn't create a nightmare for unemployment. As a matter of fact, there was crisis because there was 70 million migrant worker that went home during Chinese New Year and they were not gonna return to any jobs. If it weren't for that, I think you know, China may be you know, running a different scheme. So I think there's a set of facts that says, well, that really worked. But then if you turn around, if China has such a good execution, it really hasn't earned all the respect. Why? You know, so that's a set of question. Interesting. Well, let me say that I, well, Einstein said that uh, if, something, uh, some, if you keep doing something that doesn't work, uh, that's the definition of insanity. I believe that's the, his definition. So we have tried uh, traditional Keynesian approaches. We've been running enormous official deficits. We've increased uh, government, federal government discretionary spending uh, dramatically by two percentage points of GDP. We've had uh, an increase, expansion of the monetary base, increase in the money supply, almost a factor of four since 2007. We've printed about $2.2 trillion. Uh, this stuff is not working, and we have to understand that some of these bold actions can actually be scaring the public and making them decide things are really terrible. When you had, in 2008, the, the, the Treasury Secretary panicked the public, I think, and so did the other members of uh, the administration and, and certainly President Obama. At the time, as a candidate, he was talking about the D word, kind of whispering that publicly about depression, the Great Depression, and everybody got scared, and the, and the firm said, gee, you know what, I've been thinking about fi uh, firing all these people and moving my operations abroad, and this is a great time because we have a crisis. Let's fire these people, and then we won't have to worry about a public relations problem with our own employees, with the ones we keep. Now, Larry, you're talking about jobs, and I have a feeling our students are very concerned about that notion. Yep. And if we look at your point about morale, if you will, in this country, yep. we're at... So I'm just, let, me just say, let me just finish and just say that, that I don't think any of this has to do with sticky prices or wages. I don't think workers were given the chance to drop their, take a, a pay cuts. They were fired in mass. You know, 500,000 people fired one, mo one month after another, successive months. That's what was happening in uh, the fall of 2008. That was not Keynesian unemployment because prices wouldn't, and the housing prices have dropped dramatically and they went up dramatically. We don't have rigid prices in this country. Yeah. Uh, and there's no real evidence of that. And, and most people who are unemployed don't care if it's Keynesian or not, probably. Yeah, if no. not taking a paycheck home, right? So, right? so here we sit. Five of every six Americans believe the U.S. is off track. 97 consecutive months in the United States that Americans have been pessimistic. That's a bad emotional environment, signals a long-term malaise, potentially. So the question of getting out of this funk is on our minds, but even more relevant for our students right now is, and I'm going to ask this of you, Jeff, even you know, change, challenge, and opportunity go hand in hand, as John said. Even in a tough economy with 9% econ uh, unemployment, and, and you could argue it's really 16% or so when you talk about the folks that have given up on finding a job, there are jobs being created out there. What do you see as you look at the, the world 
where do you see the jobs? What kind of industries do you see the jobs? I'd like to hear your perspective. And, and John, your perspective from, from Asia would be very helpful on this as well and any others. But Jeff, let's start with you. Well, I, I think the, uh, it, it, it's dangerous at a time like this when we're at these moments of seismic shift to extrapolate where have the jobs been and expect that to be where the, where the jobs will be. My industry probably maybe the best case in point where you know, who wins when everybody's levering up, when, there's, when the debt intensity is rising? Finance, right? The people creating the paper and shuffling it around. Who loses when it go, starts to go the other way uh, is probably also finance. Uh, so uh, it's probably not in, on Wall Street. And not that there won't be jobs there, but I think net, 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 this is a shrinking sector. The growing sectors, though, are in the areas, you know, where has the crisis created the opportunity? And I'll circle back to real estate, because I think we're pretty close to real estate becoming a sneaky way to make money again. We've had, a, you know, there, there ought to be a sort of steady state growth in the supply of, of housing as populations grow, et cetera. And as far as the supply has gone, it's been very constrained in the aftermath of this crisis. You mentioned that uh, housing starts have been very, very low levels for a very long time. So we've been underperforming the sort of natural growth rate, partially because we, we had way too many to begin with. But at some point, we'll begin to naturally be starved. And on the demand side, one statistic that sticks in my mind, I'm going to have a show of hands here. Who knows somebody who's living in their parents' basement? Nobody. All right, here we go. How about who's living in a group house that would prefer to live in, a, in their own place? Right? The, the rate of household formation, which isn't home ownership, it's household formation, whether you're renting or buying, is at the lowest level in nominal terms, not even, you know, not a population adjuster or anything, in nominal terms in my entire lifetime. And it's, it's because of these sorts of things, and it does tie into animal spirits, and it does tie into distorted pricing. But these adjustments have been taking place. And so one of the smartest guys that I've worked with in my career, as an example, left his job at my company. He was a big shot at my company, and he left. And what he's doing is he wants to try to unlock this potential energy for housing to re-engage, basically by finding homes where the, where the price of the house is deeply discounted, the residents can't service their mortgages. The banks aren't allowed to foreclose. It's all kind of stuck. And he wants to buy the property and rent it back to the residents. And nobody gets dislocated, but things start to get freed up again. And I, so I think it's, it's just a question of, of, of creativity and maybe a little entrepreneurship and, 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 and optimism that will create the job formation, I think, going forward. And are there any sectors you can think of that, that really represent opportunity? I mean, for years, America said healthcare was an insulated sector where there was always going to be jobs, as an example, or defense used to be that way, too. And I think if the policy mix get, it, it gets, is, is correct, we, I, I think policy and healthcare ought to be focused on shifting the supply curve out as opposed to shifting the demand curve in. And uh, it, it's... Right now, I'd, I would have a hard time making the decision to be a doctor, but that's silly, right? There should be, we should be able to have confidence that that, that, that would get uh, sorted out. One interesting fact about today is that the corporate sector is absolutely booming. It's not even sector specific, but the, there's, there's a reluctance to take risk now. In, the, the, the profit share of our national economy is at record levels. And that, I think, at some point has got to get un unlocked as well. But at the moment, it's, 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 you see it in hiring. The unemployment is staying very high. You see it in capital, in capital spending. This money's just kind of sitting there. John, about 30% uh, of our undergrads and 40% of our graduate students at the School of Management for our, from outside the US, uh, what does your lens tell us about where the employment opportunities are over the next several years? Well, you were saying I'm here when one stone couple of birds. One of the birds we're trying to kill on this trip is to uh, to do some campus recruiting. There's obviously demand for high caliber, well trained professionals to work in in Asia. Asia, China, I want to draw a contrast. So in China, you have plenty of low level manufacturing jobs, and uh, but then there's a shortage of a high highly trained professional financial services, for instance. We did this campus recruiting trip starting from Shanghai to university, top ones, two in Beijing, 
and now in Columbia University, and now we're moving to Boston, and we're going to go to Chicago. And I um, did a little survey with that group last night in New York. I said, you know, compare with what you see in China and what you see here, where would you want to recruit? And they're, they're saying there's no doubt. Here's the place to find these high-caliber professionals, which says a lot. Uh, and I wanted to see another story and then, you know, come to my point. Uh, I still maintain a home in Silicon Valley. And I've lived and worked there for, for, for more than 15 years. And if you go to Silicon Valley today, there's not as much a unemployment feeling as some other places. As a matter of fact, with Facebook, with Twitter, everything else, there's a shortage. You know, housing prices are not coming down because uh, I'm trying to buy something and you know, bottom fishing, but the bottom hasn't come. Uh, when I learn about capitalism, and when, you know, 10 years ago, U.S. was fighting China to force China to open up, to join WTO, there was this great theory about, you know, um, um, allocation of resources in an optimized way. So China did that. Now China is enjoying this growth, but underneath that growth, here's a basic phenomena. U.S. will not be able to create employment if it creates low-level manufacturing jobs. So you can't have it both ways. You can certainly bring manufacturing that China does to the States, but then everybody needs to step down a few notches in, their, in terms of their living standard. And if you don't believe me, <laughs> go to China and see how these employed workers are living. Okay, and, and so that's why I'm, I'm saying this is a system um, issue and it's global. So I think we need to think about rebalancing. Uh, look at Europe. Uh, Greece has this debt problem. And I think everybody in theory knows how to solve it. But then they don't want to have it on their own. If, if it compromises my living standard, then this principle doesn't work. But there's, it seems there's no getting around. Sooner or later, we're going to see a bit of a rebalance. Okay. Let's turn to regulation for a moment. Several questions on the cards coming up relate to regulation. And Michael, what role, you were in Washington, you were inside the Beltway, uh, what role do you believe regulation can or should play in getting America moving again? Well, I agree with Jeff that the prob one of the big problems we had was excessive debt. And with the, there was a lot of financial innovation that occurred that, that had a lot of good aspects about it, but, but we didn't understand it very well, and, and, and we didn't regulate it in a way that, that prevented uh, the excessive run-up of debt. So I think that's the first regulatory problem to solve, is to figure out how to, uh, how to limit the amount of debt that, that, um, that parties are taking. And, and how would that happen? I mean, is there enough, is there enough uh, glue in Washington that people could agree on anything uh, in terms of driving anything, regulatorily or legislatively? Well, it's, it's hard to be optimistic that Washington uh, it, 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 it would be up to the task, even if I could tell you exactly how that should happen. But I don't know, I might have to defer to Professor Kotlikoff. On well, you know, I, I think it's... We need the right kinds of regulations, and sometimes we need simpler regulations. Regu if we had, you know, if you look at Dodd-Frank, uh, everything that's happening with Dodd-Frank has very little impact fundamentally on the nature of our financial system. Uh, what Dodd-Frank is trying to do is go back to Glass-Steagall, draw a line in the, in the sand between commercial banks and investment banks, and say, and this is Paul Volcker's view This has been adopted here because everybody else in the administration didn't know what to do. Paul Volcker said, hey, let's go back to Glass-Steagall, work for my lifetime, and commercial banks were gonna carefully regulate, investment banks can do whatever they want, and uh, if they get into trouble, we're gonna let them go. They're gonna just fail, and commercial banks, we won't let them trade on their own account, we won't, well, that's the Volcker rule, we won't have proprietary trading. So this is the new set of regulations, and it comes with like a 20, 2,000 page book and then it provides instructions for committees to make 
2,000 page additional books of regulation. So it's going to stiltify the entire financial system as it currently exists. So we're going to have the worst of, we're going to have the existing system, which is awful, uh, com combined with, uh, you know, much more regulation, which is, you know, probably going to stymie uh, uh, any good advantages of the existing system. Now, think about it. Did, did, uh, did we have an experiment in 2008 and September 15th when Lehman Brothers failed? It was a investment bank. The government let it fail. And all hell broke out. And that's exactly what Paul Volcker, and God love him, he's a great American, and I think very highly of him, but I think his position that we should return to that kind of situation where investment banks are too big to fail, we're going to let them fail, we're not going to let them fail. And so the whole, you know, the whole regulatory uh, approach to fixing this financial crisis hasn't actually come up with anything useful. It's made things worse, as far as I can tell. And uh, we're living under that that uh, that shadow, if you like, whatever, uh, that problem, because we don't have a financial system that we can really trust, and now we've just made, this is really, a Dodd-Frank was a full employment bill for, uh, for regulators. So if you want to talk about a growth industry where you guys can find jobs, become a bank examiner. <laughs> Uh, sage advice, I'm sure, Larry. Uh, interesting, isn't it? Uh, let's move to a kind of a lightning round process here. I've got a number of questions we still haven't been able to get in from our students, and I'd like to raise them one by one. Uh, the first relates to ethics. Uh, and, and the question really relates to the fact that there have been numerous corporate ethical breakdowns in the last decade, Enron, Tyco, WorldCom, Lehman Brothers, now MF Global, and Olympus, uh, very recently to name just a few. Uh, has Have unethical behaviors contributed to the crisis uh, and is there a message to be taken here as it relates to the importance of ethics in business? What's that one? <laughs> Lightning round, huh? Lightning round, Jeff. <laughs> yes. I, want to get I as think many there's a, there's, there's a lot of work to do in the areas of incentive systems and accountability. And one of the confusing aspects, I think, of, of uh, the financial crisis, even in the recent vintage, is the degree to which individuals were able to become dynastically wealthy creating losses that weren't ultimately their responsibility and that were perfectly legal to, to perpetrate. And it's, it's always a gray area whether where their behavior was unethical versus just uneconomic. But in any event, there's got to be a stronger connection, I think, to, to recourse and accountability, even if it's not, uh, strictly speaking, an ethical issue. So good behavior shields good business. John, uh, Mark, um, Michael, do you want to add something? <laughs> Well, I think it's very important that students learn more about ethics because I think you, you, you're you naive if you think you're not going to be put in a position where you might be called upon to break the law and you need to, to understand, you need to be prepared for how you're going to respond when you do that. As a public policy matter, we make a huge mistake if we're going to rely on ethics to prevent the collapse of the system, that we have to presume that people are going to be unethical and create laws that that protect the system against it. John, I have a lightning round for you. Did you, or did you want to respond to this first I, question? I just want to add a few comments. There's a, you know, a difference between unlawful and uh, unethical. Uh, while, you know, uh, things like Enron, the court of law has spoken, you know, they broke law, they should go to jail. Ethical standard, on the other hand, is much more complicated. And in my experience, is that when it talks about ethics, everybody needed to start from themselves. For instance, we're talking about a borrowing habit. You know, you know, one of the reasons for I think for the uh, the events that leads to financial crisis is that the government tend to do a popular thing, putting everybody in homes, so the lenders are not worrying about credit, which is the old trade, and the guys who are getting the loan are not too worried about affordability. You know, there's, there's, if you really want to draw a very, very strong line, there's ethics that are involved. When you borrow, do you intend to pay back? You know, just to draw things. So when it comes to ethics, I think it just needs to be from everybody. And uh, some of the issues that we need to solve here in this country takes everybody to re rethink about this kind of sacrifices they have to do, they have to put in, to solve the problem. Sacrifice is part of it, isn't it? And John, I have a specific... You know, the fact is very simple. You know, we're living in a standard where we haven't earned it yet. You know, it's on borrowed money. It, so we've got to earn it now. Uh, John, a quick question that came from the question, uh, audience. Uh, how, how does China 
see the United States and European debt crisis? Is it cultural stupidity or irresponsibility? No, no, no. It's none of that. China still, but certainly for many, many years, take U.S. as the teacher and take European as the envy. Uh, and I think majority of Chinese are still thinking that way. If you look at how many parents are sending their kids to American universities and European universities, how many Chinese consumers are buying Gucci bags and the GM cars. So I don't think that uh, as a set of people, Chinese people are very much like U.S. people. They all have their own uh, understanding. And uh, the government, individually or collectively, doesn't represent what people okay. think. Okay, another lightning round question. Uh, do you think the Occupy Wall Street movement can be effective in any way? Well, <laughs> yeah, I think that they, uh, these people are legitimately concerned about the future of the country and that they, that the, well, they see Wall Street as a corrupt institution, and, and I think it is largely the case. And, and this uh, trust, this system is very fragile, because if, you, if you're going to trust Lehman Brothers on day one, and you can't see what they're doing, all the trust ends up residing with the person at the very top. In that case, it was Dick Fold. And uh, at some point, people lost trust in that guy from basically one day to the next, or you know, six months to the next. And there was a run on that bank. And, and so people, you know, I don't know that the Wall, the Wall Street protesters know exactly how to express their, you know, what exa put their finger on what's wrong with the system. But they know there's been a lot of fraud. Uh, and the fraud was at the bottom of this uh, crisis and that nobody's gone to jail. And that they're out of jobs. And they have a real legitimate reason to be upset. So I applaud their, their actions actually uh, going and protesting. And we need to change, but we need to understand how to fix things. Next question, is it possible to develop a universal fiscal policy globally for all nations? I'm going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say yes. Well, that was certainly a lightning round uh, response, I must say. Jeff. In the spirit of the lightning round. I'll say yes. I, I, I think that we should, but uh, given the, the current situation, we, we, it's a difficult challenge. It's probably a few generations, you know, takes that time. Wow. Next question, is there a third political party requirement in the United States to break the logjam that appears to exist by the traditional Democratic and Republican parties? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now we're getting into this lightning round idea here, Larry. Uh, where were you earlier? That's great. You know, should all entities, companies, banks, and sovereign nations that are in trouble be allowed to fail? Yes, if the financial system is, is uh, you know, this is a, a big externality. For the, it's like a highway. Could you say that gas station owners should be allowed to fail? Well, they could fail personally, but if they all failed and took walked away from their gas stations with the keys to the pump, we'd have no highway operation. The system would break, the highway transportation system would break down. So you have to realize that the financial system is, a, is an exchange system. It's a, there's an externality when it breaks down. So we have to get the financial system in a situation where it can't uh, break down, where it's safe, and then we can have failures. Then we can have Greece default, Italy default, no big deal. Why shouldn't they be able to default? People, they had to pay higher interest rates to borrow money for the possibility that they might get into trouble. And a lot of the trouble they're facing today is because of our crisis in 2008. It's American grown, and we exported it to Europe. So they should be able to, fall, to, to, to fail, and they can't fail because of the way the financial system is structured. So we need to fix the financial system based on limited purpose banking, then they can fail. One more lightning round, and then I'm going to ask the same question of all of our panelists before we adjourn for the day. And, and this, this question, the last lightning round is, what kinds of improvements uh, in the economy will firms need to see, or in the general environment need to see, before they more generally start hiring again? And hopefully it'll be in the next three to six months, I'm hearing <laughs> on this card. I think it's the confidence. Confidence. And how does that evolve? Where will the confidence come from? Expansive fiscal policy. Larry, what do you think about that? <laughs> I, I think <laughs> <laughs> this is like doubling down. When you, you know, this country is so in debt, it's $211 trillion in the hole, and he wants to expand fiscal policy. Uh, 
we, we need to make sure there's a, a country for the young people. We can't leave all these bills. We can't keep mailing them up. We have to think out of the book in ways that are not uh, traditional because traditional ways haven't worked. And when I say get the top 1,000 CEOs together and get them to, to collectively pledge to hire people, that could matter. That could be the thing, the confidence changer that makes everybody uh, think things are over. That we've actually switched our equilibrium, flipped to a good equilibrium from a bad one. That's what we need to do. And that won't cost us a penny. That'll actually generate revenue. And we haven't tried it. We should do it. It's cheap. D didn't we try that with the National Recovery Act? Well, you're talking about Roosevelt in the, in the 30s? The National well, I don't know that uh, we actually had employers. I don't, know, I don't know the history of the National Recovery Act. I know we had the government trying to, to hire people directly. But maybe you want to fill me in, because I, I'm not an expert. Can I make a history. suggestion? Yes. I'm going to drag us to a slightly different place. We're talking to folks that could sound like they were in the House of Representatives in Washington having this very battle right now. <laughs> Aren't we? I mean, this big debate, it's one that's not an easy one to answer. It's very different perspectives. You know, what I would suggest we've just gone through together for this last almost hour and a half is something that Walter Lippmann once said, was when everyone thinks alike, no one is thinking. Uh, would you agree with me? These gentlemen are really thinking about the future. They have our best interests in mind. Would you join me in a round of applause and thank you? I said there'd be one more question before I do a very brief closing, and the question really is, is hopefully from the perspective of each of our students here. Uh, if you were to, each of you, give advice to our students generically, what advice do you have for our students as they contemplate entering the world, coming from academia, whether it's this year, next year, or the year after, what advice do you have our, for our students as they strive to navigate in what we would arguably say is a a turbulent world at the very least. What's your advice for our students? I'd say find something you really love to do and don't get too depressed about the economy because there's actually still lots of jobs out there. And do your thing and do something good for other people. Well, I'd suggest uh, to believe the world actually belongs to you guys, uh, which is true, by the way. You know, these are fading and uh, you're going to take a... <laughs> All the, the definition statement and conclusion we're drawing, but it's irrelevant. You're going to take over the world, so embrace it. You'll figure it out. If you go back to the last time we had a really deep recession, which was the early, really through the 80s, uh, it would have been easy to despair then. But if you look back at that period, there was a lot of exciting stuff that was happening in the economy. There, there was the growth of the personal computer industry. There were all sorts of of, of, of information technology industries that were growing. Look for what's going to be the, the counterpart of that for the next decade, because when we come out of that crisis, uh, th those opportunities are being created now and they're gonna pay off in the next 10 or 20 years. I would say, don't be afraid to think for yourself and draw your own conclusions. Some of the biggest mistakes I've seen people make are when they go with consensus, when they embrace conventional wisdom, because it's easy and made available, and there's certainly there are people making money on, on trafficking in conventional wisdom. But you've got to, it's, you've got to take on the, the, the perspective that it starts and stops with you, and make your own choices, and don't be afraid to question things like, home prices always go up. It's, it's, some things just aren't always true, and it's, it's up to you to take responsibility for those decisions. Have the confidence to do it. Wonderful insights, and I can't help but break rank as a moderator and offer a piece of free advice from my perspective as well, if I, as if I, if I might, and that is, you know, as individuals, as students, perhaps the most important thing we can do is focus on those things we can control. No one in this room is going to change the course of the world entirely when we graduate from college or from our, or get our graduate degree. But getting our best possible education, that's something we as students can do. Uh, we can have confidence in ourselves and try our best. We can behave and operate in a highly ethical manner. Uh, we can be humble in how we engage. And although there's no guarantee, perseverance and hard work pay off in both good economies and bad.
come to the end of our time together. Thank you to our panelists once again for a wonderfully stimulating conversation. With us, this is the first of what we would hope would become a continuing series in the life of our school of engaging dialogues on relevant topics for you, our students, and for the future of the world. Thanks again. Enjoy. <laughs>